it's another episode of the Wobcast 2.0, Season 2, Episode 2, still waiting for a defensive coordinator. Are the Minnesota Vikings and Vikings Nation? Hello, everyone. It's Wobby, Mike Wobshaw, along with Giles and Chase. Per usual, we are here for the next oh, hour or so to talk Minnesota Vikings football with you. And our focus remains on the Vikings defense. It's top of mind because the top job on that side of the ball is still vacant. We will talk about that today. Also on today's show, we'll look at the PFF grades of some backups and starters wondering what the replacement scenario would be had the Vikings done that at some point in the season. We'll discuss a list of potential free agent targets for the Vikings on defense, further thoughts on the defensive coordinator candidate since they haven't hired one yet. And lastly, uh, our thoughts on championship weekend and how it might inform our opinions of the Vikings off season. But before we get to any of that, let's say hello to Chase and Giles. Hey fellas, how's it going? Hey, hey, what a weekend of football, huh? Like that yeah, was, was some good games. Uh, I always live for championship weekend and uh, like usual, it didn't disappoint. No, it did not disappoint unless you're Chase. I think it disappointed him. <laughs> Maybe right? just a little bit, but uh, yeah. we're so really excited for the bowl. Don't worry. Okay, yeah. all right. Because we know we know Chase has a little a little crush on the Bengals here, and uh, they <laughs> they were on the short end of um, I don't know if we call that a thriller, but the short end of a barn burner, that's for sure. And let's begin there, guys, uh, with the with the conference championship games and maybe some just some takeaways. You know, a few things come to mind as I'm watching those two games: the Eagles defeating the 49ers in a very weird game, and then um, and then the Chiefs over the Bengals. You know, I, I'm seeing just a really weird situation at quarterback for the 49ers, where they literally don't have a a healthy, capable quarterback on the field like halfway yep. through. <laughs> so strange. Yeah. And and then also in the Chiefs Bengals game, I'm seeing injuries left and right. To even even to, on the Chiefs side of the of the ball uh, of the fence, they were losing yeah. guys. Yeah. And I can't help but wonder if the owners and the competition committee and the league in general is going to look at a, a subtle or maybe major change to roster sizes, um, mm -hmm. and give teams more players. Um, to have active on game day because i mean you don't do that you have them play more games it's just it's a recipe for for guys to get hurt um yeah. and and for teams to just almost have to submit to the attrition i'm wondering guys if if we might see some tweaks and i would love it i'd love it all 53 guys can be active you know yep. and the reason they didn't do that in the past was because it was like you can have 53 players on your roster, but only 46 can be active on game day. And the reason they did that is if you were really banged up, say you had seven guys who couldn't play, mm -hmm. they didn't want a scenario where Giles team had 53 active players and Wabi's team only had 45, right? Yep. So they wanted to avoid that, but that's over now because they've expanded the size of the practice squad and they've yep. allowed you to have six veteran players on your practice squad. So I wonder mm -hmm. guys, if maybe we'll see a change because a lot of times what sparks a real change is when something goes wrong in a playoff game, yeah. right? Where All they eyes are on you. Yep. Yeah, right. So uh, it wouldn't surprise me, guys, if we saw a change like that. Yeah, 100%. I think uh, when you pair that with the expansion of the salary cap, I believe today it came out that the salary cap is expanding by 20-ish million. Um, so now the teams have a little bit more wiggle room to, to go to work. I think there's obviously two ways to look at that, either – uh, keep up with the inflation that is happening at several positions uh, yep. and be able to account for that or and or add in uh, additional players when it comes to the the, the quantity underneath that cap. Uh, yep. I think there's a projection that the salary cap will go up to at least 250 within the next year or two. And maybe it could go up even further if you expand uh, the overall uh, count, because I think this weekend was really, really telling. It shows you can have the best team on the planet. Um, the 49ers are one of those, in my opinion. Yep. There's not too many areas where they have weaknesses. They are stout at every position, but you are as weak as your, or you're only as strong as your weakest link. And the yeah. quarterback is by far and away the most important position in football, much less all of professional sports. And when it goes away, all that talent basically uh, evaporates. So uh, I think you're really going to see that as a linchpin to, to driving more change. I completely agree. Yeah. Yep. Um, and, and I think I'm all for it. It sounds like you would be two guys and look, not every change the NFL makes is good. Uh, but most of the time they get it right. My only gripe is sometimes it takes them a little too long to do it. And I think yeah. this one has been a long time coming. And yeah. when, when 
the COVID situation opened the door for bigger rosters and bigger practice squads. I think the next domino to fall should be this, should be having all 53 players active on game day. But um, that's neither here nor there for now. Uh, that's yep. a topic for later on in the off season. Um, yeah. To put to put a uh, sort of a wrap on these conference championship games before we talk about how they would inform our opinion of the Vikings off season. Kyle Shanahan, for my money, coach of the year this year, guys. Mm -hmm. I think probably some regrettable moments early in that game, not challenging the Devon the Devonta Smith catch um, mm -hmm. on fourth down. That was probably a mistake. Yeah. I thought um, the NFL made a mistake by not jumping in. I don't know if it was the NFL who made a mistake or Fox, but the punt that supposedly hit the camera cable, yep. that's a significant issue there. Yeah. I also <laughs> had, I took exception to the roughing the punter penalty on San Francisco. I thought he got blocked into him. I thought he mm -hmm. got blocked into him. I thought that was a missed call. Um, yep. So well, I thought those were some misgivings there in that, in that the early championship game uh, on the officiating, officiating side of things. And I think the officials had a rough championship weekend in general, unfortunately. How about the Eagles O-line and D-line? I mean, oh, if that, I mean, <laughs> if watching that does not inspire you to want to just go all in on the interior D-line and O-line in the draft and free agency, I don't know what would. I mean, yep. those guys dominated this game. And San Francisco, we've talked about it, is a physical team. Like, you mm -hmm. feel it after you play them. And the yep. Eagles pushed them around like they were schoolyard bullies. Yep. I've always been of the belief that if you look at the end uh, of every season, no matter what season you're looking at, last uh, this year, last year, 10 years from now, uh, 10 years ago, you're always going to find solid offensive lines. That's part of the formula to winning a championship, in my opinion. Whether you have a mobile quarterback yeah. like Patrick yep. Mahomes or a statuesque uh, quarterback like Tom Brady, all of them have had at least top five offensive lines. So... I go into championship weekend expecting good offensive line play. But with that being said, Philly's a whole nother breed. They're hands and, away, hands yep. and feet away from uh, everyone else that's in the elite category. They are a show-stopping unit. Yep, absolutely. Um, and and the Eagles' defense from top to bottom, from, from the front line guys to the back end, very good. Two mm -hmm. free agents from their secondary. That would be interesting for the Vikings and other teams to look at. Uh, in Bradbury and Gardner Johnson. And then a guy up front, Javon Hargrave, um, is another one for the Vikings to possibly consider. Eagles uh, will not be able to retain all of their upcoming free agents after a Super, Super Bowl run. It's just not going to happen. So yeah. some good players will hit the streets there for sure. And Vikings may have their eyes on some of those players. I thought, um, you know, as unfortunate as it was to see San Francisco's season end the way it did uh, by not having a, a quarterback on the field for almost half the game, I do think Philadelphia was the better roster and the better team. Uh, so as much as Vikings fans hate to see it and admit it, Philadelphia coming out of the NFC is appropriate. I think they were the mm -hmm. best team all season. Now, did they have a, a quote unquote easy path to the Super Bowl? Relatively speaking, they did. Uh, they mm -hmm. certainly did. Uh, but they got there and both things can be true. They are the best team in the NFC and they had a relatively easy path to the Super Bowl. Both things yeah. are probably true. Um, on the AFC side of things, the Chiefs uh, winning that game, there was a, a moment in the fourth quarter, uh, guys, where I thought the Bengals were going to come out on the other side of that thing. I thought they were going to win the game. Uh, mm -hmm. But then a couple of things went against them. The backbreaker was the roughing the the passer, the roughing the, the quarterback penalty. I guess it was not roughing the quarterback. It was um, – it was a uh, um, – was it unsportsmanlike conduct uh, or I forget the exact Yeah, call. I don't know if it was unsportsmanlike conduct or unnecessary roughness, whatever right, it was, it was it on was. the sideline. Unnecessary line. roughness, so, yeah. Yep, leads to a shorter uh, potential field goal, a game-winning field goal that Harrison Butker does indeed hit. Uh, so Mahomes toughs it out through his ankle injury. Chiefs lose a bunch of players but still win the game, and, uh, and they'll face the Eagles in the Super Bowl. I do believe the Chiefs were initially installed as the favorite, and then in like 20 minutes the line flipped. And the Eagles are now the favorite uh, by two points in the Super Bowl with an over-under, I think, of 49 and a half. So mm. that's the early line anyway in that game, which I think to me is is a toss-up. Uh, you probably have the two best teams in the league for the balance of the season who will yeah. battle it out in the Super Bowl. Any early thoughts on that matchup? That's a great question because I believe the Eagles are a tougher team uh, pretty much in every way. Like they are a brute force team that's going to hurt when you play them. 
Yep. Um, but I do believe the Chiefs are far more creative. And that is a, a compliment to the Chiefs, not an indictment on the Eagles, um, to the point where I think they might be able to out-scheme the Eagles. Because um, yeah. I love Andy Reid. Uh, aside yeah. from Kyle Shanahan, I think Andy Reid is probably the best coach in the league. He's creative. He has uh, extreme respect from the locker room and is able to translate that directly onto the field in a way that is actually productive. You see a lot of people that are trying to get cutesy and creative, and it yeah. doesn't really do much. His teams do much. Like they, yep. they're a show-stopping uh, unit, and I would only expect that uh, even more so on the biggest stage. Yep. How about you, Chase? Yeah, um, I mean, obviously on the AFC side, the Chiefs are a really good football team, but the Eagles, they're, they're just kind of an enigma to me. Um, because, yeah, you know what, they, ha- they had a really uh, easy path to the Super Bowl, but at the same time, they outscored their opponents 69-14 to 14 over two games. Um, so you got to ask yourself, you know, what else did you want them to do? Like, I mean, they killed those teams. So yeah, they had an easy path, but what else are they supposed to do? Um, but then experience comes into it. You know, Andy Reid, Patrick Mahomes have done this a couple of times. Jalen Hurts, Sirianni have not. Um, so it'll be fun to watch. I don't know. Game for Andy Reid. Yeah, technically the Kelsey goal, there's, there's a lot of storylines to follow. You're right. There are, uh, certainly. And last thing here too, and uh, interested Chase to get your opinion on this. You know, I was on the betting side of things, on the prediction side of things. I was I was on the Bengals side in this thing. I, I, I just think they're they're a tough matchup for the Chiefs from an X's and O's standpoint. And I think Joe Burrow's got obviously he's got some big game swagger and confidence to him. But I thought the Bengals got a little too big for their britches before this game. I, I think they almost took away their own advantage because they kind of could have played the disrespect card. Like we've beat this team three times. We're the road team again. Everyone's still betting on them like that. Let that be a motivation to you. But instead, I kind of feel like they turned that around by calling Arrowhead Burrowhead. But, you know, the Cincinnati mayor got a little outspoken. I kind of thought maybe and, and, and this might might not really factor into the outcome of the game, but some Chiefs players were talking about it after the game. So I kind of think it does factor in. And so I wonder if there's any regret on the Bengals side of things for just getting a little too loud about that. I think there definitely is. Um, they, they've they also, last year, they had this huge underdog spirit that kind of, I think, yeah. carried them into the playoffs a little bit. They lost that. You know, they had, they were in the Super Bowl last year. They're the AFC champions. Uh, or yep. they, I mean, the yep. reigning AFC champions. And I think they kind of lost that whole underdog spirit, um, the swagger. Um, but also, I mean, the, the Chiefs just, they were ready for them this time. And it's really hard to beat a team four times in, what is it, like 14 months now? I yep. forget the exact time frame. But Beating that team four times in, in a small amount of time is a very hard thing to do. So yep. mm-hmm. agreed. And it was still close. <laughs> right. Right. That's right. And and our, I mean, I I think the referees had some influence in that game. And I do not well, I I know the NFL is not rigged, and I'm not saying the referees wanted Kansas City to win, but I think the Bengals were on the the wrong end of a lot of close calls. Mm-hmm. Um so anyway. Let's talk about the Vikings. That's why people are here to listen and watch. Uh, They want to hear about the purple. So um, we do believe what we saw in conference championship weekend can inform uh, opinions about what the Vikings should do here in the off season. And to me, the primary takeaway there is you got to get big and rough and strong and tough on the interior of both your defensive line and offensive line. Um, So with that in mind, let's talk about the Vikings roster and an interesting piece of content that Giles came up with over the weekend related to PFF grades and some personnel decisions and outcomes for the Minnesota Vikings. And essentially, Giles, and I'll let you take it from here, what you're getting at is take a look at some of these players who weren't starters or who didn't have the majority of the snap share and their high PFF grades in general, but specifically relative to who they could have replaced Mm-hmm. that of guys who were starters and had much lower PFF grades. And you've got a few examples four actually, and they're on all levels of the defense. So yeah. that's kind of the setup for this talker. And I'll let you take it from there and kind of explain a little bit more. A hundred percent. So uh, I exited the Viking season trying to remove myself from the emotion because I think uh, everyone I would talk to just said, uh, hit the reset button, tear it all down. Our defense was horrible. 
Um, and although when you look at the results, I would agree, uh, we played very, very horribly, but I try to remove myself from that and say like, how do you actually fix this? It's not productive just to say, tear it all down. Cause even if you do want to tear it all down, you're not actually going to tear it all down. You're going to take some strategic pieces and move them around. So if you were to do that, what would you do? What is the pieces to go fix, fix the formula and, and improve for next year? Right. And I started looking at our starting lineup and I compared that with all of our backups. And when you look at our starting lineup, um, it's really a tale of different sides, really, because when you look at uh, our front three in a 3-4 defense, you have Dalvin Tomlinson, Harrison Smith, and Jonathan Bullard. Two out of the three scored above a 70, which uh, to, for the, the audience, like 70 and above is considered to be above average. And yep. if you're into the 80s, you're getting into a great category. And Dalvin Tomlinson scored a 77.1 grade in, in uh, PFF which is borderline very great. Uh, Harrison Phillips was a little above 70, so he was great. But Jonathan Bullard scored a 56.5, and I would say that's getting into the below average category. Not train wreckish, but below average, that's for sure. So two out of your three um, were great. The other one, not so great, right? When you yep. look at your middle level, when you look at uh, your middle and outside linebackers, your outside linebackers, contrary to popular belief, scored very well. You had... Zedarius Smith, who scored an 82.2, so that is great category. And Daniil Hunter scored an 86 grade, which is almost yep. elite. Like yep. that is two very, very great outside linebackers. Mm -hmm. When you move inside is where things became an issue. You had Eric Kendricks and Jordan Hicks, and that uh, they scored essentially in the, the low 60s, which is is below average, right? So your middle yep. linebacker room, not, great, not doing great. And when you move up to the secondary, you have Patrick Peterson, who scored an 80, which is great, right? Cam Dantzler, uh, for the majority of the season that started, lower 60s, so below average. Your safety room, you had uh, Harrison Smith, who is about a 70, which is is good, above average. And you had Cam Bynum, who scored a 58, so he's below average. So all that to say, at every level, you have things that are above average, if not great, and you have things that are below average, no in between. You're either they're great or you're 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 bad, right? So yeah. I was like, all right, well that that helps me start formulate what we need to do in the off season to fix our offense because or fix our defense because we have things that are great and things that are horrible. Let's let's fix the things that are horrible. Well, then I was like, all right, where where would you go fix these things? Where do we find people to to find another cornerback or find another safety to fix these positions? Well, when you look into our roster. Right below that, you actually have the replacements, in my opinion, because if you yeah. were to factor in guys that played um, cornerback, safety, middle linebacker, and defensive tackle, all right, go look at the best backup players on our team. All of them are in the 80s. You go to the safety room. If you were to take um, uh, uh, Cam Bynum and yeah. replace him with Josh Metellus, Josh Metellus, who played at least 20% of snaps, was ranked the second best out of 96 qualified safeties in the entire league. The second wow. best, he scored an 85.1. He was right. almost elite at that category. Yep. Now, I, I recognize he didn't play every snap, but he still played 20% of snaps. That's not a, yeah. a small sample size. He didn't play two snaps. He played enough to qualify him to actually take a starting job, yep. Yep. which is huge. So, and I think it is fair to wonder, although he qualified, and has okay. enough snaps to snaps to qualify. Okay. If he played a starter level number of snaps, mm -hmm. would there be some some reversion back to the average there? That is fair. However, yeah. he qualified. And the number to qualify is not a low number. It's it's a requisite number to grade a player. Mm -hmm. So it is as fair as it is to wonder if he played more would the grade drop. It's equally fair to argue that he played enough to for us to judge him. You know, yeah. it's like it's, even giving it's, him a shot. <laughs> yeah, it's like to Chase's point, like if you're the Eagles, it's like, yeah, we had an easy path to the Super Bowl, supposedly, but we crushed everyone. We outscored everyone by, you know, 60 points. Mm -hmm. What what else can we do? That's what someone like Josh Metellus could say. Like, what what more do you want me to do? I can only play so many snaps, and on all those snaps, this was my grade. Second point mm -hmm. before I let you keep rolling here, yeah. Giles. And this is across the board, not just Metellus. It just tells you as hard of a game as this is, as hard as it is to build a roster and to be good. When you are, the perception is you're really bad at something. And people would say the Vikings were really bad at defense. 
the fix is not very far away. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to suggest that making these four changes would, would have done it for the Vikings, but I am going to suggest that you don't necessarily need an entire over overhaul to fix right. the defense, especially if your offense is going to score 25, six, seven, eight points a game. Correct. Yep. I think both things to pair together a hundred percent. And really I paired this down to four specific players on defense where yeah. I said, Hey, if you were to take these starters out of their starter role and play a backup in the starter position, I think at bare minimum, you get better. I won't project exactly what that would look like, but I'll, I'll explain what this is. So if you were to take Cam Bynum, Cam Dantzler, yep. Eric Kendricks, and Jonathan Bullard, um, players at each level, at cornerback, safety, middle linebacker, and defensive tackle, okay? And you take Cam Dantzler, you replace with Josh Metellus, Cam Dantzler, or I'm, I'm sorry, Cam Bynum and Josh Metellus, yep. Cam Dantzler and Duke Shelley, which they did later in the season and he did very well. Yeah. You take Eric Kendricks and you put in Brian Asamoah, and then you take Jonathan Bullard and put Kyrie's Tonga, I think your defense becomes at least top half of the league. Because if you make those changes into a starting role, there's only three players on your entire defense that score below a 77. And okay. 77, once again, is getting into the great category. Not even yeah. like, oh, you're above average. You're, you're in the great category. And the three players that are below 77 are Harrison Phillips, who did very well this season, and he scored a 72. You have Jordan Hicks, who scored a 65, which you can't be great at every position. So like yep. it's yep. at least average. And then Harrison Smith, who scored about a 70. Um, so the point is, I think you would have had a significantly better defense with that category. Now, if you're going to take a, a lens and kind of zoom out here, if you make these changes personnel wise to improve your performance across the highest percentage of snaps and, and this is a big and, uh, remove the amount of penalties that you incurred on defense, which was, I forget the exact number, but like the second most penalties in the entire season, we gave up basically a thousand yards in penalties. If you yep. fix those two things, I actually think we have a pretty good defense. Now, yeah. a lot of these players are becoming free agents. Some of them have significantly higher cap hits. So like, there's a lot of things that uh, prevent you from completely running it back and trying what we're suggesting. But the point is when you're complaining about the Vikings saying they had a horrible defense, I think they put the wrong players on the field and they made too many mistakes and made penalties. Yeah. I think if you're yeah. pointing their finger at two things, those are the things, which yep. if you're trying to fix them, part of that means bringing in a new, a new defensive coordinator, which they're doing. They are doing. Uh, and with that will come a possible change in scheme and certainly a change in personnel because that comes in every off season and uh, of a course. different coordinator is going to have different uh, desires from his personnel. So the personnel is going to change. And mm -hmm. this is not to say like, it's unrealistic to suggest the Vikings should have benched Eric Kendricks for, for Brian Asamoah, right? Like we, You're we understand, right. Yeah. We understand that wasn't going to happen, but the point on that one is that the fix ne is not necessarily very far away. Sometimes it's on your roster already. I think a broader point too, or at least a, an ancillary point is if you did one or two, of these changes, Giles, that you're suggesting, how would it have potentially positively impacted the two or three guys that you kept, right? So if mm -hmm. like, if you made the change with Tonga, would that mm -hmm. have enhanced Kendrick's ability in any way, right? Or Great if you would have made the change at safety with Bynum, uh, with Metellus, would that have helped out the Duke Shelley Cam Dantzler situation in any way. So there's not everything is like, you know, in a vacuum. These these yep. things are very interconnected. Yep. I think uh, that's a great point. I'm blanking on his name. You'll you'll have to remind me. He was the safety from 2018 um, that played opposite of Harrison Smith that essentially led the league in interceptions. Um, he went to the Eagles afterwards. Oh, Anthony uh, Harris. Anthony yeah. Harris. He's a great yeah. example because yeah. uh, in 2018, he led the league in interceptions. He was considered an elite safety. We had the best safety duo in the league. There's yep. a whole like headlines about it. Now in 2019, our defense made uh, pretty big shifts um, in not a great way. We got bad at a lot of things. One of those things was run defense. Yeah. And we had very significant issues where our line, linebacker rooms were struggling with the run. And that year, Anthony Harris played very, very poorly. He played on a franchise um, tag, if you remember correctly. And everyone's yeah. like, oh, he's washed and they moved on. And I'm like, how do you go from being one, the, one of the elite safeties in the league to everyone's writing you off the next, the next year? And I took that as our scheme 
stayed the same, but our personnel uh, uh, declined where we really had to take the entire linebacker and front seven to really stop the run. And Anthony Harris wasn't able to play the same way he used to play. So I think in uh, support of your comment, it's a very interconnected game. Failure at one position can really cause another player to have to play differently to make up for those deficiencies. Absolutely. And I think it happens a lot on the offensive line as well, Giles. I mean, I think when you have a linchpin at center, I think your concerns at either guard spot are mitigated, you know, and I think when you have a stalwart anchor at left tackle, I think, you know, you don't need a great blocking tight end quite as much or Mm -hmm. your third down running back isn't a great pass protector. You can get by with that, you know, because you put your left tackle on an island and you're good. So, yep, uh, it's an interconnected, uh, it's an integrated game uh, to use the term Giles used uh, for the first time that I've heard it in football. It's an integrated (laughs) game, right? So, um, and, and you are only as strong as your weakest link on defense and with the offensive line, most certainly. So, yeah. I just thought it was really good, interesting fodder, Giles, that you produced over the weekend. And a lot of teams could do this. And, mm-hmm. you know, if you if you see the graphic, and I'll post it uh, this week too, you know, the way Giles did it was, it was, you know, it was the basically the graphic was blinking. And it was like, here's what it looks like with Duke Shelley in there. Here's what it looked like with Cam Dancer in there. And it showed the grade. And, you know, I, I just, I thought it was a really cool illustration of, you know, the personnel questions that every team is faced with and a hypothetical of what if this guy had played more. And in, a, in some of those cases, guys, I think we're going to see, I think we're going to see Duke Shelley play more snaps next season. That, that would be my guess. If we can get guess. him resigned. <laughs> yep, that's right. Yep. If you can get him resigned, I, I yep. think you're going to see him play a lot more next yep. season. Um, you know, whether we'll see that with Metellus or not, I don't know. Uh, Asamoa or not, I don't know because we don't know what the future holds uh, for Kendricks. Uh, and I think the team likes Cam Bynum, so I think they may feel hard pressed to replace him. But I might be wrong about that. But yep. um, anyway, we won't know until they finally hire a defensive coordinator. Only then will we start to get breadcrumbs and clues as to what they're going to do from a personnel standpoint. But I think the broadest point of all remains: your cupboards are not bare in Minnesota on defense. You mm-hmm. you don't have to go break the bank at every position. Um, of need you might have a guy already on your roster and player development is so very important in this league and I think it's even more important when you're in the cap situation the Vikings are in right Mm -hmm. and you've got some some pretty high-end pieces um, that take up a lot of the cap so you got to develop players and you got to get by at spots with a player like Josh Metellus or Brian Asamoa Um, and so we'll we'll see which one of those guys the Vikings uh, can tap on uh, to, to play more snaps next season. I have a feeling it'll be um, at least one of them uh, and, and mm-hmm. probably two. So we'll be interesting to see what it is. Would also be interesting to take a broader look at that too, at just some other teams um, mm-hmm. across the league, right? You know, um, and just see if there are other, and, and, and just see if there are maybe some potential hidden gems that like, and the Kendricks one is a good example of this. Like, If you just take an inside linebacker on another team that's sort of like, you know, part of that team's identity and it's like, ah, maybe we could be better here, but like, he's, you know, he's our guy, you know, like, like Chad Greenway was for the Vikings Mm -hmm. later in his career where it's like, yeah, we could maybe get a little bit better there, but like, what does that say to our locker room if we get rid of Greenway? So Mm -hmm. you keep Greenway and then a younger developmental player gets away from you and then goes to another team and is really good. So if I was a GM and you brought this to me, Giles, I'd say awesome exercise on our team. Now go do this for the, for the league, yep. you know, and I want to see some of those blinking graphics for the Patriots and the Ravens and the yep. Cowboys Who's a diamond in the rough. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a great way to find them, you know? Yeah. Especially when you can indicate that they've played at least 20% of snaps. So it's not like a complete flyer. Like you had one good snap, you know, cross your fingers and go for it. Yeah. Um, like you could make that argument um, slightly about like Brock Purdy, for example, for the 49ers. He had a few good games. Um, like, yep. do you move forward with him or do you not? Right. And do you have enough sample size to be able to make an accurate judgment? Uh, in my opinion, you do. I think he played enough games. But uh, at the end of the day, um, you, you need enough sample sizes to be able to make an accurate judgment. And I think, you know, 20 percent of snaps is a, is a good threshold when you're trying to sign a player like this. Yep. So, I, yeah, I think that's a great exercise. Yep. 
All right, let's uh, let's move on and talk about the uh, Vikings defensive coordinator uh, opening, which is uh, obviously still vacant. Uh, we've got uh, a pretty good hunch that Brian Flores would be the Vikings' preferred choice, uh, and the reason for that is if he's a candidate to be the head coach in Arizona, and so obviously Brian Flores likely would not turn down that opportunity to be the Vikings head coach. He would want to know that he's no longer an option in Arizona before he agrees to be a defensive coordinator with the Vikings. That's what I am presuming. Uh, Mm -hmm. Giles, it looks like you are as well. So we believe that that's the first domino that needs to fall is the Cardinals need to hire a head coach. And if that is not Brian Flores, I think that he likely would be become the Vikings defensive coordinator. So when the Cardinals are going to hire their head coach, we don't know Um, if it is Brian Flores, Sean Desai, Ryan Nielsen, and Mike Pettin uh, would stand to, uh, to be the guys targeted by the Vikings. Those three also conducted interviews for the uh, defensive coordinator position Mm -hmm. uh, with the Vikings. I don't have any reason to believe that there's someone on staff with Philadelphia or Kansas city who's under consideration. If that were the case, it'd be at least two and a half weeks before the Vikings could hire that person. I think that's a long time to wait. Mm -hmm. Is someone on the Bengals or Niners staff going to be considered now that they are out of the mix? That is a possibility, but I still think the strongest possibility is Brian Flores. We talked about these four candidates last week on episode one of season two of the Wobcast 2.0, so we don't need to break these guys down. But Giles or Chase, I wanted to give you the floor here if you wanted to say anything about those other three candidates uh, if Brian Flores is not the guy, do you have a preference on those three or do you think there's a surprise candidate in there that we haven't talked about yet? Uh, I think Ryan Nielsen might have just been announced to go to the Falcons as the okay. defensive coordinator. So I think he's off the so he's out. The, um, the the opportunity list, which I think further emphasizes that we really wanted Brian Flores, because if we really wanted Ryan Nielsen, we would have already made an offer. Right. Yep. So that yep. tells you that. Until Brian is off the the opportunity list, we're going to go after him, which really, if we're calling a spade a spade, is now kind of worked back to Sean Payton. And I think the Cardinals, if I'm reading the tea leaves correctly, want Sean Payton. Yep. But until Sean Payton says no, they're not going to offer it to Brian. Um, so it's kind of a ripple effect across the league. Like everyone wants somebody different, and but they want to hold on to their backup option until the other one says no. Exactly. So I think that's happening for us. Yep. Um, so if we have to pick between Sean Desai um, or Mike Pettin, essentially, if we can't get Brian Flores, I want Sean Desai. Um, I think uh, that is maybe the best option for me. I'm not necessarily in love with Mike Pettin. Not necessarily because um, I think he's a bad coach, um, but he was also in the room. I think if you have to spread, uh, spread blame around, he's not, uh, he's not innocent necessarily. Like he could have stepped yeah. in as the assistant head coach um, to, done, to have done more. So I think if you're looking to make a change, make a change. Um, uh, so that tells me that Sean Desai is maybe in a leading category. Now, I've said before I'd love it if Raheem Morris could be dropped into yeah. the mix, but I haven't heard any steam on that. So unless they came out of left field, I'm unfortunately thinking that's not going to be a, a, um, a go for a game. Um, now, I did see recently that the Dolphins hired um, – uh, Vic Fangio. I didn't realize yep. he was technically available. He was a, yep. a defensive assistant from the Eagles. Um, so that's interesting. Um, but obviously he's off the, the, uh, opportunity list. So honestly, Sean Desai, how about you, Chase? Uh, honestly, 110% tunnel visioned on Brian Flores. Uh, I love what he's done uh, in Pittsburgh with their linebacker room. Um, and honestly, if it's not Flores, I don't want it. So, wow. Okay. <laughs> there that's we go. Where we're at. Well, then I think, uh, you better watch what's going on in Arizona then because yeah. <laughs> uh, you have a very uh, strong vested interest in who they decide to be their head coach out there. Um, there and uh, I really don't think Sean Payton's going to take a job this, this rotation. I, I think he's sitting this one out and mm-hmm. I, this is he's waiting semi- for the Cowboys. <laughs> yes. Exactly where I was going. Oh yeah. Like, And it's a little reckless to speculate on that, especially because like, I know Mike McCarthy gets a ton of hate from a lot of people for a lot of reasons. Some of it's valid, but I kind of like, I kind of like him. Like he he's got a great record as a head coach and I know he had Aaron Rodgers. I get it, you know, but, um, you know, if the Cowboys had moved on from Mike McCarthy, that would be a chapter in the NFL is a tough business book. 
you know, like, Mm -hmm. like in most years they would have won the East, but the Eagles just happened to be unbelievably good this year. The Cowboys were good enough to win their division, you know, obviously made it to a playoffs, won a playoff game. And and people were talking about the one seed. Yeah. I mean, people are talking about Mike McCarthy, maybe not being back, but he wins that playoff game against Tampa. And it's really hard to move on from him at that point. But I do think Sean Payton is waiting for that moment to happen in Dallas. Um, where you know he becomes the head coach there. That's just my hunch. Mm-hmm. And so I found it interesting that Dan Quinn decided to stay as mm-hmm. defensive coordinator because he was being interviewed as a head coaching candidate and decided to stay in Dallas as a defensive coordinator. And yeah. I wonder if Dan just feels like he's got the best chance to win a Super Bowl as an assistant in Dallas over being the head coach somewhere else. So that's what he wants to do. Or if Dan mm-hmm. has his eye on the head coaching job, I don't know what his yeah. motivation was for staying there. But I think Sean Payton's got his eye on that spot. The other place I think Sean yeah. Payton would would go if the head coach there is relieved of his duties is the Chargers, who yeah. a lot like the Cowboys are always kind of right there, but mm-hmm. never like all the way there and over the top and yeah. ownership. The, the AFC Vikings. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. So I wonder if that's sort of a target of Sean Payton's. I don't think he's taking a job this go around. Therefore, mm-hmm. I think Flores is the favorite in Arizona, or at least is is got a shot to land it there. So Chase, mm-hmm. uh, if that happens, I'm sorry. Uh-oh. If that doesn't <laughs> happen, I do think Flores will be here. Either No matter how you look at it, um, I think a week from now we should probably know, and we can talk more about that um, in, in next week's episode of the Wobcast 2.0 because it will certainly dictate uh, a lot of what we talk about here, or at least how we talk about what we talk about here. Cause we mm-hmm. want to know what scheme they're going to run. If it's going to be a three, four or four, three, do, does this, does this coordinator, has he called plays in the past or not? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, we want to know all these things. Does he play a lot of man or a lot of zone? Does he pressure a lot or not? What's his philosophy mm-hmm. on young players versus veterans? I mean, all these things. Mm-hmm. And then I think we'd be remiss to not men- mention uh, Ejero Evero as a candidate too, who's currently with the Broncos, but may not be with the Broncos this upcoming season. Um, so uh, he's yep. a candidate as a head coach in some places. And then certainly he'd be a, a coordinator candidate for any team looking for a coordinator if the Broncos mm-hmm. choose not to bring him back. So yeah. Including the Cardinals. Uh, yeah, as a head coaching candidate okay. there. Yep, yep, absolutely. So uh, a few dominoes still to fall uh, with the two big ones being Sean Payton's decision and then Arizona's uh, related or subsequent decision. Uh, that will dictate whether or not the Vikings get their man, who we believe is Brian Flores, but time will tell. All right, uh, before we get out of here, uh, a, a quick talker. I unveiled four potential free agent targets for the Vikings this off season, depending on who is the defensive coordinator and what the philosophy is. This is not the be all end all uh, of free agent uh, wish lists for the Minnesota Vikings. This was honestly my initial thought after looking at players scheduled to become free agents this off season. I believe Giles has some data pulled up on these four guys, and we're not going to spend a lot of time doing this. Just some fodder, just something to chew on before we say goodbye to episode two of this season's Wobcast 2.0. So are you ready, Giles, to give us a brief rundown on each of these four? Yes, let's do it. And if it's cool with you, let's start with uh, Hargrave from the Eagles. Defensive interior number 97, exactly. Um, Before I get into the data here, uh, one of the reasons that made this incredibly intriguing uh, beyond his performance is the fact that he's coming from the Eagles. Obviously, the Eagles are having a phenomenal year, uh, but also something to mention is that um, the Eagles employed uh, Vic Fangio as their defensive assistant. Now, I, although Ed Donatel, Ed Donatel rather, uh, didn't necessarily run our scheme super well, he was tied very closely into the Vic Fangio universe, right? So if sure. you do decide to run it back, this is a category where if it fit into to, uh, Vic Fangio's system in Philly, maybe there's a chance it could translate over here. And this yeah. is also assuming that one of our defensive linemen on the interior does not come back, which I know is a possibility, right? Yep. Um, but he played very well. He had a phenomenal year. He ended the grade uh, end of the year with a 79.9 nine grade um overall defensive grade and had a 91.2 pass rush grade so if you're looking to get pressure up the gut this is the guy um which i think is definitely uh, a moment of uh focus for the vikings when you move forward let's get some some pass rush and let's let's bring it up the interior so a phenomenal uh phenomenal player he even got better as the year went on uh, when you look at the first half of the season versus the second um his last game um, against San Fran, he had a 91.1 grade. 
uh, <laughs> defensive grade, just elite player on the yep. interior. So uh, unless the Eagles decide to re-sign him in free agency, I think uh, the Eagles or the, the the Vikings should make a play at him if they want to shore yep. up the interior. Sounds to me like an expensive signing, a um, a big contract. Don't know if the Vikings can do that. Don't know if they are specifically interested in Hargrave as a player. We are only suggesting his production, his career arc, and his style of play might fit. That's the suggestion mm -hmm. here. I think Javon Hargrave, as free agents go, would be a high-level signing, like sticker shock on the contract, a lot to live up to, mm -hmm. uh, but but this is the the type of guy that you hate to see go if you drafted him. Like you, you want to retain this guy if you can, but you can't retain all your good players. If Hargrave gets loose, I think the Vikings should and will have their eye on them. Who's mm -hmm. next? Let's go over to Ashan Robinson from the Los Angeles Rams, defensive interior yep. number 94. Um, this is an interesting one because um, if we could get him, that maybe is an argument to go get Raheem uh, Morris from the yep. uh, defensive yep. coordinator, but I'll, I'll uh, stop that argument. Uh, but yep. he ended the year at a 64.4 grade. So um, face value, you would say, oh, it didn't have that great of a year. Um, however, when you look at previous years, for example, 2021, he ended the year at a 77.7. .7. And one thing to note is that he spent almost half the season hurt. Um, so he was battling injury. So if you see, you know, in years past, he's played well. I think this is a guy you take a flyer on to shore up an interior. Even if it's a backup spot, I think this is a guy you could get a, a discount on uh, coming from the Rams where Kevin O'Connell knows he can, you know, get some inside scoop on this guy. Um, he had some games where he even had a 91.2 pass rush grade against Dallas of all teams, yep. who has a, a great offensive line. Um, so I think there's a, a point where you could make that uh, he's a guy worth signing. Um, so, yeah, Ashawn Robinson. Um, I, I love, yeah. I, I think size um, here with him appeals to me. I think attitude, style of play, swagger. 330 pounds. I, I think he'd be a good, yeah, I think he'd be a good guy for the locker room and for it. Like we got to build an identity here, guys. I think he's an identity builder. You know, yeah. I think you can find a guy who might be technically better, like a better technician. I think you can find a guy who's more athletic, more of a specimen, but mm -hmm. full package and getting away from all these elite signings, trying not bargain bin guy, because that's certainly not the case here, but just a value guy and an mm -hmm. identity builder. That's what I see in Ashawn Robinson. So I didn't want to give four names that are just four elite players. Mm -hmm. I wanted to sort of mix in some role players and some some intangible, some guys who could bring intangibles. And I think Ashawn Robinson brings intangibles. Also, Ashawn Robinson started his career with the Lions. And mm -hmm. that was at a time when I was with the Vikings. And no matter what year it was or what coach I talked to, they were like, this guy, this guy is a pain in the ass. Like this mm -hmm. guy, he's going to kill us. Like that's what we said, you know, about him. Yeah. And he didn't always, every game, some, some, some weeks the Vikings had a good plan for him. But he was a guy that coaches thought about when they were preparing for the Lions. Yep. In 2018, he ended the year with an 89 grade uh, overall defense. Yeah. He was elite in 2018. So if you can bring him back to 2018 form, I think you got yourself a, a, yep. a, a great player. Um, so then translating over, you know, more into the edge side of the fence, we have Charles, and I always forget how to pronounce his last name. Uh, Amenahu. Yep, that's it right there. Yep, exactly. That's what I meant to say. Um, he's an interesting player because when he entered the league in 2019, uh, he ended the year at a 59 grade. So not great. Um, however, he has consistently improved since then. Last year, uh, he ended the year at a 69 grade. So he obviously every year has gotten better and better and better. And this uh, entire 2022 season, I would say he was relatively boom or bust. And when I say boom, mm -hmm. he had multiple games in the 80s, if not high 80s, uh, in terms of games. He was elite in some of these games. And he had a few games where he ended in the 50s. So if you look at the overall uh, edge room for the Minnesota Vikings, if we are able to maintain Daniil Hunter and Zedaria Smith, you have a good pairing, right? They're not a train wreck if we're gonna, you know, uh, if you wanna be uh, mean about it, but they're, they're great in my opinion. Um, and if you have to move off of them, I think this could be a really interesting player if you feel like you could develop him further because he plays currently for the Texans and the Texans don't have much going for them on the field or off. Um, when it comes to coaching, I don't think he's getting a ton of development. So if you can yep. bring him in and think you can tap into his good side, I think there is an elite player behind him at uh, hopefully a price point that you can afford. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, 
and again, didn't want to flood this idea or concept with like a bunch of household names, no brainers, like everyone mm -hmm. knows these guys are good. So, um, you know, this is another one who fits into that category. And again, like who's the coordinator, who's the play caller? Does he fit into your identity? We don't know that. Mm -hmm. We don't know who the coordinator is. Uh, but again, just an idea. And mm -hmm. we have one more and this one, I think this last one guys is going to trend more to like the pricey, mm -hmm. like, blue chip player yep cam sutton from the steelers yeah he had a pretty great year um, when you look at overall defensive grades and even coverage grades which is something very important to look at when you're looking at a cornerback um he had quite a few games in the high 70s and the 80s um he ended the year uh at a 72.7 um yeah. he had some issues in the pass rush which when i'm thinking about a cornerback if you have to have one issue uh in their skill set pass rush i'm okay dealing with a few deficiencies but when it comes to coverage run defense tackling he was fair um this is a a, a very solid signing if not completely above average i wouldn't yep. say he is a a lockdown corner top five but he is going to be a an above average way more than serviceable cornerback to help you shore up your secondary a secondary in which you have very few players technically under contract right now that's right um that that is right there is a little bit of a rebuild going on there i i think um mm -hmm. you know in the secondary where you've got a few guys that you can include or that you can keep mm -hmm. um but this is a group that is i mean this this is like you know the yellow tape under construction the viking secondary mm -hmm. is under construction um mm -hmm. and this this could be a good piece uh for the vikings to add now we reserve the right to amend this list uh, to change it uh, going forward. And we certainly will have, um, you know, some some hard and fast stances on guys we hope the Vikings sign. But we won't know that until we have a defensive coordinator and we can catch some commentary from O'Connell and the new defensive coordinator and Quezzy about the types of guys we want to bring in here on defense. Um, so as we get that information, uh, we'll have uh, varying opinions on, on free agents, but, um, you know, they call draft picks, the lifeblood of the NFL and, and of a roster, but you have to supplement it in free agency. Um, and you got to do it in smart ways. So that'll be a fun talker, uh, for the rest of the off season. All righty. Um, anything else in the notebooks that we need to empty out before we go? Uh, real quick. It was, uh, it was announced this morning that Daniil Hunter is going to be going down to Vegas this weekend to participate in the Pro Bowl. He's going to uh -huh. be joining a couple other Vikings. Um, he's replacing Philadelphia Eagles linebacker Hassan Reddick. Um, mm -hmm. He's got bigger fish to fry the, uh, the next weekend. But uh, I think it's right here. I can't speak for all of us here, but I think it's uh, Daniil Hunter had a better season than uh, – or he's a better player than what this season showed. So yeah. it's cool that he's still getting uh, still getting some recognition as being one of the NFL's best. So just wanted to give him a little credit there. Yeah. Does that move the Vikings into the number one uh, quantity team of Pro Bowl players? I know we were close. Eagles are – Eagles are out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it probably does. I believe it. Um, and – and more of that to come probably i mean mm -hmm. you know with with injuries and uh and guys who decide they don't want to go you might get a couple more vikings in there too so for sure yeah and we had a few snubs like the fact that christian derisa isn't in the pro well, bowl yeah, is an atrocity I, yeah. exactly exactly i mean he he's arguably an all pro i you know like Correct. like if you just built one team you didn't even have like you have an afc and an nfc you just built one team with the best players in the nfl he'd be on the roster you know yeah. so and I pick him over Trent Williams, not because I think they're both amazing players. They're one A and one B, but you have the rookie cap hit. So that's where I think yeah. Christian Derrissa is the better player because he's literally mm -hmm. in his second season and right. he is a show stopping force. But if you need to body slam someone, you would want Trent Williams. He has the attitude of it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> since he uh, literally did that yeah. on Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> when that happened, I was like, oh my gosh, am I watching WWE? <laughs> yeah. Like, what I mean, that, I shows mean, you I how bet. strong he is. Exactly. Like that was I mean, not no small guy that he picked up and threw. <laughs> like I'm not promoting violence, but it shows he is a. Oh, yeah, yeah that's a good a point. Guy. All righty. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of the Wobcast 2.0. Next week, we'll have thoughts on the defensive coordinator hire for the Minnesota Vikings. Let's do a little senior bowl recap. Not that we're down there and watching every second of the practices, but uh, we'll be able to, um, to pay attention enough to maybe have some opinions on some of the guys coming up in the draft who are seniors, lots of good players 
every single year come into the league and played in the senior bowl. So we'll certainly keep our eye on that. And then we'll start to shift our focus uh, for the off season from a personnel standpoint on the Vikings offense next week. So all of that is to come on the next episode of the Wobcast 2.0. We're glad you're here listening to this episode to find past and future episodes of the Wobcast 2.0. Just go to wherever you find all your other favorite podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify. We're also on YouTube. You can find me on Twitter at Wobby, and you can email the show, the real Wobcast at gmail.com. That's going to do it for today. On behalf of Giles and Chase, this is Wobby signing off for now. Skull Vikings. <laughs>